Hello, everyone. Welcome to our talk today uh, at the Pulsar Summit Europe, uh, building a real-time analytics application with Apache Pulsar and Apache Pino. And with me today, my name is Mary Grigleski. I'm a developer advocate at uh, DataStax. And with me is uh, Mark Needham from StarTree, also a developer advocate. And right here, if you'd like to have uh, your uh, access to the slide deck, here's your QR code and uh, the, also the bit.ly link. Okay, let's, uh, let me start. So who is Mary? I'm a streaming developer advocate at DataStax, which is a company that's um, majoring in NoSQL uh, with Apache Cassandra, and now also with Apache Pulsar with the streaming. Plus, we also have a real-time AI uh, feature engine now called Cascada. Um, previously, I was with IBM uh, as a developer advocate, uh, mainly with Java open source and also the bit of the open source side of WebSphere. I'm based in Chicago. I'm also Java champion, president, um, board member of the Chicago Java Users Group and other groups in the Chicago area. Uh, before this, I was a developer for over 25 years. Um, and now on to Mark. Hey, so yeah, so I'm a developer advocate as well, but for Apache um, Pino, so it's Star Trek, so we do uh, the Apache Pino real-time LAP database, um, kind of doing all sorts of stuff. So we do sort of talks, um, documentation, helping people in the community, and I write about stuff um, on my blog as well. So I'm just going to hand back to Mary to just quickly run us through the agenda. Sure. The agenda, we'll start with what is real-time analytics and giving you some insights and uh, introduction concepts uh, behind it. Then Mark will also talk about the examples of real-time analytics. And then we'll then talk about how do you build a user-facing real-time analytics system. And we get into the data ingestion side and introducing to you Apache Pulsar. And then Mark will introduce you to Apache Pino for his real-time analytics capability. Then Mark will also give a demo and we also talk through some some, of, some parts of it, uh, the demo, and some sharing with you some resources. Cool. All right. So let's get started. So what is real-time analytics? So it's always kind of sometimes useful to start with the definition. So this is Gartner's definition of real-time analytics. So they define it as the discipline that applies logic and maths to data, and then probably most importantly, to provide insights for making decisions quickly. So that's the main goal of whatever we're trying to do. But let's have a look at a more practical example. So ac across this talk, we're going to be focusing on events. So events are like things that, generally things that have happened. So like you uh, RSVP'd for the Pulsar Summit. You attended the Pulsar Summit. You maybe got on the train to go somewhere. Like things that that happened. And so we're capturing those, those raw events. And the events on their own are interesting, but it would be quite cool if we could actually gain some insight into them. So like, what can we learn? Like, what can we do? Uh, as a result of knowing those events have happened. And then once we've gained that insight, so maybe we learn something about the events, we then want to do something or help, maybe help people to do something. So that's the that's the whole purpose of this talk is um, how can we build systems that uh, take those events and do something with them and then allow people to do act to do some sort of action, ideally like in the in the real time flow rather than um, maybe maybe tomorrow we want somebody to do something today. So hey, if they're looking, searching for a particular thing, maybe we want to get an advert up there that, that is interesting to them. If they're trying to find something to eat, we want to be able to say, hey, look, you could buy it from, from here. So it's all about, can we get people to do some sort of action like in real time? And for our purposes, this diagram showing the value of data over time is quite interesting. So you can sort of see it sort of slopes sort of down. So it starts off quite valuable and, and it kind of goes down. And for... What we're talking about when we talk about real-time analytics, we're sort of focusing on the stuff that happened or it, or it, like the stuff that just happened. So it's like maybe like a few hours, maybe even going up to days. But after it goes beyond that, we sort of go into the realm of um, of data data warehouses or lake houses and and and, so, and sort of away from from streaming. But you will often see the two uh, kind of playing in tandem together. So who's interested in this type of data, like this data on the left-hand side? So it's, it could be analysts, like wanting to see like in real time, what is actually going on? It might be the management. So imagine we have a, a pizza shop and they're like wanting to know like, hey, what's going on? Like, are we are we having a, a shortage of any of the ingredients? Is there suddenly like a big increase in the um, people requesting a particular menu item? And then it, as I say, like on the previous slide, it could be the users. Like, can we get the data back to the users so that they can do something with it? And the applications that we can build uh, in this area kind of split, like sort of one way of looking at it is they split into these four quadrants. So <clears throat> um, 
we've got machine facing at the top, we've got human facing at the bottom, that's one axis, and then internal applications and external applications on the other one. And so we'll start with internal applications. So a machine facing internal application could be something like what you would do with, um, with something like Datadog, so observability. So I wanna, I wanna see like what's happening with all my, all my machines in my cluster on AWS, like what's actually happening? Are, are the, do we need to replace them or any of them slow? Is there anything going on like that? And then in the human facing side, it would be something like a real time dashboard. And that's, just, I guess it's slightly different than what you would see. Like not, there are obviously dashboards are very, are very popular, um, but they've been traditionally created based on data that's from the past, like data from yesterday or data from a few days ago. Uh, and so the update here is, hey, it's data that just happened. Like literally just came in from a streaming system and we're gonna be able to gain some insights from it. Coming over to the right hand side, External, this is where a real time, like I guess the, the user facing type of analytics comes in. So we're, we're, if we're putting an external application, it means that the number of users that might consu consume it or use it is gonna be way higher. That might be a recommendation engine. So, <clears throat> hey, someone's buying this thing. Can we get like an idea in, the, in there, like uh, when they're purchasing this one item, like, hey, here's some other items you might be interested in based on like what's just happening now. Like what have people been doing recently rather than, uh, maybe some, capturing some, some data from the past. It might be fraud detection, right? That could be another example. So, hey, in the real-time flow, can we stop someone from, I don't know, doing a transfer, um, uh, I don't know, buying, like making a per purchase, like something like that. If we can detect, hey, look, there's something weird going on here. Can we stop that from happening? And then sort of in a more human facing one. So those top ones would be like, hey, a machine is doing something and, feed, and putting a result somewhere. Uh, for an external service, it might be, hey, can I see where my order is? So, you know, like, like how you see on Uber or DoorDash or Just Eats, when your um, delivery is, is on its way to your house, you can kind of see like where it is. So you get like a quite a quite a um, real-time update of the location of the order. Examples of real-time analytics in real life. So LinkedIn, uh, it's quite a good one. So I guess hopefully most of you have seen the who viewed your profile page. So this is updated in real time. As you can see, like up, pretty much up to the up to the second, who's been looking at your profile, and this is a sort of example of a user facing uh, uh, analytics where there are a lot of users <coughs> and a lot of people looking at this page at the same time, and we want to make that page still refresh very very uh, quickly. Uh, and interestingly, the the people who have uh, who use it the most are probably followed by a lot of people, so they might be getting a lot of views on here. So there there will be. So we need to be able to, to get those th those queries done quickly. The news feed is another one. Um, at this time, rather than sort of uh, satisfying your curiosity of who's looking at you, the goal here is can we get engagement on posts and put stuff in front of people that is fresh? Uh, not, not we ideally don't want to show them the same stuff that they've seen already, but we want to show them stuff that, that we think they are going to find uh, find interesting, so that they're going to engage with the with the newsfeed. Uh, the talent pool report is another one. So this is, I guess, it's a little bit of a smaller set of users. So this is more aimed at recruiters. And so it's like, hey, in real time, where are the jobs available? What, 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 uh, what areas? Like, what, what skills are are are, um, are companies looking for? That that sort of thing. Uh, and another one would be Uber Eats. So this is kind of the the, 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 um, the restaurant example. So we've got a, imagine we're running a this is the re restaurant manager dashboard. So imagine we're running a restaurant and we want to see what's going on with my restaurant that's sitting on Uber Eats. So I want to see like what's the sales look like. If I missed any orders, can I go and fix? those uh, missed orders. If there is, was an inaccurate order, can I go and sort that out so that, that I don't get a bad rating from my customer? And then at the bottom, you can see some top selling items and menu feedback as well. And then again, this is like, there's a lot of users uh, using it, but probably less of them for each um, each instance. And all of these systems, they have some specific properties. So the first one is we need to be able to get the data in really quickly. So we've got to get it into like our streaming data platform. So like in this case, it's going to be Pulsar. Can we get that data, those raw events in quickly? And then can we get those into some sort of real-time OLAP database? And then when we query it, we want to be able to query it quickly. So whatever tool tooling we're using, we, want, we need to be able to get query, queries executing very quickly. So fresh data are queried in the milliseconds rather than in the seconds. And then finally, it needs to scale up, right? So we need to either have be able to handle lots of users, or maybe if it's a dashboard, it's the same dashboard sending lots of queries uh, up to the, uh, to the database. So the, this is what it would look like. So we can build, if we're building um, one of these systems, Pulsar and Pino are quite good tools uh, for doing that. And they allow you to achieve these properties that we've got sort of uh, written around the outside of this diagram. So we've got to get real-time ingestion. We need to often, we're often working with very high dimensionality of data. We want to get the data in there very quickly. 
And then we want to be able to, like, we kind of want the sort of standard features, the high availability, scalable, cost-effective. And then on the right-hand side, we also want to be able to get, like, very fresh data and query it very quickly as well. So I'm now going to hand over to Mary, and she's going to talk us through the Pulsar component of this architecture. Mary, you're muted. You have to unmute. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so we jump right into the Pulsar now. Um, as you can see, this is a high-level diagram describing all of the components of a Pulsar uh, ecosystem. Um, so primarily, Apache Pulsar is a publish subscribe uh, uh, pattern, follows that. And so it has brokers that are there to actually handle uh, receiving the messages from producer and then also letting su a consumer subscribe to the messages and broker will be the one that uh, deliver uh, all the messages to the consumer. So as you can see over here, this is conceptually looking at a broker, we can have you know more than and most likely to in any production system, you will have more than just one broker because there's, this will increase the throughput. And basically producer will produce messages to a topic and consumer will consume, uh, subscribe to only topics of their own interests. And, and then also too with Pulsar is that it doesn't handle all of the log messaging, managing all of this persistent uh, log messages. Rather, it um, delegates all of these responsibilities to, as you can see in this diagram, all of the bookies underneath. So this is like, bookie is like uh, each like operating units of the bookkeeper uh, subsystem too. So well, that's what it is. Broker communicates with Bookie. Bookie is a highly efficient um, system that manages all of these records and allows you to, to have fast read and fast write um, and also maintain the data integrity too. And over there on the right-hand side, you, you see a ZK and that zookeeper is there to keep everything um, in sync, uh, the things that are in the cluster. Um, so it oversees uh, this whole operation of this ecosystem. So that's kind of Pulsar in a nutshell. And next slide. Okay, so here, let's just quickly go over. This is uh, such as Pulsar Summit, so I don't need to go through every single bit, bit, but these are highlights of Pulsar, if you're new to it. It's an open source project created by Yahoo um, back in 2013 or so. Then they contributed to uh, the Apache Software Foundation, making it open source in 2016, and very soon became a top-level project in 2018. Um, and Pulsar, uh, what it is very significant is that it's already de designed uh, from the beginning with the cloud in mind. So it is a very cloud-native uh, type of event-driven new channel generation of event-driven system is cluster-based and also supports multi-tenancy that allows you to organize all of your messages in a very organized manner. Um, also, essentially, too, you can um, isolate all of your groups of messages as well. So making it very um, kind of very easy to use and you don't need to, you know, as developers, you don't need to worry so much about uh, dealing with uh, how do you organize all of these messages. And so multi-tenancy is one. And also, too, uh, it has a simple client API. Uh, so many client bindings too, uh, primarily is Java, uh, because the broker is a Javaless, uh, sorry, a serverless uh, Java JVM running. And uh, so it uh, supports Java client, but if you are a C Sharp, uh, you, it also supports C Sharp, Python, Go, and also other community co contributions such as like uh, Rust and uh, Scala, all these are supported as well. These are maintained by the community. And it also, to Pulsar, separates out the compute and storage, so making it very easily uh, scalable too. They are all independently scalable. And also uh, guarantee message delivery. That's very important in any messaging systems. So as, as long as you send your messages over received by the broker, it will be delivered accordingly. So even if something goes down, don't worry about it. The whole ecosystem will ensure that your messages gets delivered to the destination. And another feature of Pulsar is its serverless functions framework, which makes it very efficient because when you're building a data pipeline, you can also use Pulsar function to transform your messages too before writing it to a sync. And then there's also a feature called tiered storage offloads. That's basically if your messages has become cold and inactive, it won't take up space. Pulsar will move them off to, for example, like S3 buckets that will be like less expensive uh, for your cloud environment. So. Yes. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Okay. So just a note to notice, right? And uh, when we talk about like real-time analytics, it requires data to be constantly be feeding into the system. So what makes it faster? As you can see, right? If we're kind of comparing with traditional uh, non-streaming system and the top there, you see, you know, for a Pulsar, it's a, again, pops up broker um, system that can take in messages in, you know, huge volumes. It ingests the data. Then immediately too, you can process the data in memory. Um, 
um, versus like below, if it's something like ETL, what it used to be in the old days, I would batch, then you write things to disk. And then from there, you need to select it, but not the case for uh, the modern system like Pulsar, because you process data in memory. And then once you process it, maybe passing through Pulsar functions, then you immediately write the data to a destination, which is we call it sync. And everything is done in memory is very, very efficient. And so that's why we want to use a modern event streaming system, such as like for cases that are like in real time analytics too. So thank you. Okay, so now we get back to uh, talking about uh, yeah. <laughs> back to me. So <clears throat> let's just quickly run through. So what is uh, Apache Pino? So you can kind of see it sits in the middle. It uh, consumes events coming in from different sources. So Pulsar, for example, um, you can also ingest data from batch sources as well as streaming ones. And then um, they will then be the data will be indexed. It can be aggregated. You can also do pre materialization as well. And then you'll be doing some sort of queries on it. This is the architecture. So let's say the data is coming in from some sort of um, some sort of stream. So in this case, it's it's Pulsar, and that data is likely partitioned. <coughs> and the <coughs> Pinot controller is then going to work out okay which um, server is each partition going to go to, and it will likely have some some copies of it, right? So there'll be like multiple copies of the, the data coming from partition one, partition two, partition three, and partition four. We then so that's the server, that's the controller, and then we've got the broker. So the broker is where the queries come in, and the broker then sends them out to the to the different servers and says, "Hey, can you give me the answer to this query?" So, "Hey, how many records are there?" Where the country is the U.S., it'll send that out to the appropriate servers and say, "Hey, tell me how many there are," <clears throat> and then it will take care of aggregating the results. So, in the last eight minutes or so that we've got, we're going to quickly run you through a demo showing how these tools work together. So, if you want to grab the demo, so it's on this. Uh, this GitHub repository, and you can get it from this uh, QR code as well. And this is going to be a real-time dashboard. So we're sitting in the bottom left-hand quadrant. And this is what it looks like. So we're going to get a streaming API. We're going to run it through a Python application. We're going to put the data into Pulsar, get it out or into Pino, and then query it from a from Streamlit. Uh, we're going to be using Wikipedia's Wikimedia's recent changes feed. So it's a continu continuous stream of events that are happening and they they actually publish it yeah they publish it over a server-side events protocol but there's a, there's a nice library that we can use to process that this is what it looks like so we've got three property three keys so event id and then data is the one that we're interested in in and so this is what the the, the data is going to look like so let's now just come over to my um, terminal so if i actually let's start in here <clears throat> so this is where the 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 changes come from so I'll just quickly paste that into my browser so you can see what it looks like. So you can see these are the events. So you see you get an event, you get an ID, and then you get a data. And you see they just keep coming through all the time. Da, 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 loads and loads of messages. So let me just close that. And we can process that in Python. You can do this in Node as well, but I like, I, <laughs> I'm a bigger fan of Python. Um, so we've got our URL. We say, hey, I'm expecting an event stream. I'm going to create a requests message, uh, like request here. So this is the using the requests library and we pass in that header uh, with this URL. And then we wrap it all up in this SSE client. So this is a, a Python library. And then we're going to iterate over the messages and just print out um, them to the terminal. So we can then call Python wiki.py and it will then print out exactly the same what we, as what we saw in the browser. So if I scroll up a little bit, you can see this is a message. It's got a schema. It's got bot, true or false, comment, ID, length, meta, and then some other stuff as well. So that's the first bit, right? That's the, the data that we're, the, the stream that we're working with, but we want to get that into Pulsar. So we're going to use this wiki to Pulsar function to uh, um, <laughs> class or file to do that rather, script. So the, 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 the streaming from the wiki bit stays the same, but then we build ourselves a Pulsar client here. So we've got Pulsar running in Docker. So we're going to say, hey, this is where, uh, this is where my, uh, Pulsar is uh, is running. So, so, so we, sorry, we've got it mapped to local 6650. Six, 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 we're going to put the data into the wiki events topic. This is just capturing, like this is just for rendering how many messages we've processed. But then when we publish it to Pulsar, we're using send a sync. You could also do send um, and, and get an, a, get a response and wait for the response. But Given that we don't really care if a message gets dropped, we'll just we'll just call send, send async and <clears throat> and sort of let it go. And then every hundred messages, 
we're going to flush it. So it's going to like force it um, to the disk. And then this is again, just for <clears throat> keeping track of our progress. So we can now let's run that, that wiki to, wiki to pulsar. So we'll get that running over here. And now on our other tab, I'm just going to get my, uh, I'm going to use the pulsar client. So just copy my command. So this is, this is the pulsar client. And we're going to say, hey, I want to consume the wiki events topic. And then we're going to give it a subscription name. And we're going to say, start from the beginning. And so this is going to print out. You can kind of see, <laughs> maybe a little bit fast, but you can sort of see like, this is what we've got. So we're being very naughty and not putting a key. So we're making it difficult for pulsar to partition the data properly. So we should probably put a key. But <laughs> we've got, you can see our content is here. Um, and you can see it's exactly the same as what was uh, as what was coming from the stream. So what, right, so that's all coming in. So we got it from Wikimedia into that Python script, and now it's into Pulsar. Next thing we need to do is get it into into Pino. So I'm just going to create a create a table in Pino, and then I'll show you what it looks like. So the command that we just ran was add table, and then we passed it in a schema and a uh, a table config. So I'll just quickly show you what the schema looks like. So the schema, it looks like this quite, I guess, uses reasonably similar data types that you would expect. So you see we've got an ID, we've got the wiki, we've got the user, title, comment, stream, and so on. Those are all dimension fields. And then we've got a timestamp as well. And then if we do the same for the table, so if we do, this is the table config. So we're telling it it's a real time table. So that means that it's gonna be expecting some sort of streaming config. And this is how we tell it to pull the data from Pulsar. So we say, hey, this is where my data is coming from, and we need to tell it how to consume that data. And then finally, this is something that you could do with Pulsar functions, but because it was quite simple transformations, we've just done it inside Pino. And so this is for pulling out a very simple uh, transformation. So there's nothing, nothing complex going on here. It's literally just, hey, get that meta field ID, stream, domain, and then map it to a column. Well, let's come over to our browser and we'll click on our query console and then we can click on the Wikipedia table. And so you can see here, we've got some, um, some records loading in. Um, so you can see we've got almost 2000, um, 2000 records in there. And if we scroll down, you can kind of see we've got some of them are a bot. You can see the comment, we've got the domain, the ID, the stream, the title, topic. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you could write, like you can write queries up here. So we could say, hey, I want to know uh, I don't know which domain is the most popular. So we could say, hey, do you need just a simple SQL query from there? Yeah. Um, group, is it group by domain, order by count bar descending? As we can see, like where's the most popular, where, where, where are the most changes being done? So you can see it's on Wikidata to start with, then Commons Wikimedia, English Wikipedia. Russian Wikipedia, I guess, German one, French one, and so on. German, and if you run it, if you refresh it, you can kind of see these number of documents are increasing um, each time that we that we that we run it. So now let's let's come back um, to here. And what we're going to do now is we're going to run a streamlet uh, application that we have. So if we do streamlet, mm -hmm. there we go. Run. So we should be able to see uh, what. Is, oh, there we go. Yeah, what is uh, what what data is coming in? So you can see these are the. So these are the events that are that are coming in, um, and we can also do so. You can you can build like a like a sort of metric dashboard like this, um, and then you can also do sort of a drill down. So if we change this to dot and then this will load another one in. Um, so if we go, let's just stop the auto refresh, and so we can kind of go down and see like who's making these changes. So we can kind of see it gives us the breakdown of bots versus. No bots, we can see the top users who are making these changes. Uh, which ones are bots, which ones are no bots, although the, the no bots kind of look quite similar to bots, uh, to be honest. And then where are the changes being made? So this is the same, right, as what we saw on our Pino uh, UI, uh, except this time it's kind of automatically doing it, right? Automatically running the query rather than us having to type it. And then we can also see what a changes are being made. So it's mostly kind of edits. And all this code is available on the repository. So you can uh, you can take a look at it on there. Uh, but for now, let's just come back sure. um, and finish off, uh, just conclude our talk. So um, if you want to play around with Pino, it's being used by lots of different people. Uh, we've got a got a Slack um, that you can uh, that you can join uh, as well. Um, and then let me hand over to, uh, sure. to Mary.
Just really quick too, who else is using Pulsar? So this, this is just a small handful of companies and we have increasing number of uh, companies. Uh, for example, at Datastax, we're talking with some big uh, you know, uh, enterprise uh, companies that are considering and they already maybe sign up using Pulsar. So including like Yahoo, uh, the original inventor, uh, this engineering team is still using it heavily, Splunk, um, all of these big companies. So, so, so some takeaways then. Basically, real-time analytics will let us create applications that gives user actionable insights, right? Then uh, everything is being done in real time. And uh, properties of all these systems like fresh data, fast querying, at scale, all of these uh, in the modern computing age. And basically, we want to kind of, we presented this and to kind of demo, demonstrate to you, Pulsar and Pino is really a perfect combination to achieve this uh, real-time analytics uh, data delivered to your desktop. And then, yeah, so thanks. Thanks for, for watching our talk. And uh, obviously, you'll ask, you can ask us any questions in the, in the section that follows. If you want to uh, find me, this is, this is where I am. And I'm nearly finished writing a book kind of covering uh, some of this stuff. And I'll just let Mary <clears throat> finish us off. Sure, just a really quick too. So this is a thank you from me. And uh, basically, if you want to sign up for the Apache Pulsar Slack, here's the link. And also there's an Apache Pulsar neighborhood that contains a lot of articles in there too. And it's a community open uh, website too for resources. So, yeah. And I think we have some additional uh, information for Pulsar. These are the top three are from the Apache uh, Software Foundation, Pulsar, Bookkeeper, and Zookeeper. And also with, from Datastax, we have Estra uh, to sign up for the for our managed cloud platform if you want to try out Pulsar for $25 US dollar per month and $300 a year. So that's a very good thing uh, for our Estra platform and also Estra database and now streaming, which is Pulsar. Luna streaming is the one that's not managed and you can manage your own cloud as well as like change data capture for Estra as well. Yep, and also too, for Datastacks, we have five minutes about Pulsar on our YouTube channel and feel free to also uh, kind of go there and visit it and get some you know quick insights, quick guidelines and concepts about different concepts within Pulsar as well. Yep. And also we have uh, data sets have awesome extra. If you want to try, you know, kind of coding, we have a lot of guided examples. You can work at your own pace. Uh, visit this link is our GitHub uh, repository. So, and also myself too, I have a Twitch stream every Wednesday. Normally, if I'm not traveling on uh, Wednesday afternoon, US time, I have uh, also do some live coding as well. So yeah. And I'll invite now Mark. Now we will take the questions. Questions. Yeah. Cool.